Hello everyone, this is Justin Paperni. I'm here with my colleague Jeff Mousseau and today we're going to talk about the people that you meet in prison. And Jeff, I'm asked about this a lot and the, the reality is the people you meet in prison are very much like the people that you meet in the free world. There's pleasers in prison, there are arrogant people, uh, narcissists, those who are wonderful people who had criminal intent, others did not have criminal intent. So prison is a microcosm of society. You're simply going to same, find the same people on the inside. The difference is if you run into someone you don't like at Starbucks, uh, you might not have to sleep three feet away from them <laughs> the, yes. the next night. You're not going to be eating yes. in the chow hall or eating dinner with them every night for the next one, two, or three years. So the people that you meet in prison, who you associate with, the friendships you form matter. So tell us about some of the people you met in prison and you know where did you go to prison. And let's talk a little bit about this to help those who are watching uh, prepare for life on the inside. Okay, well, uh, kind of in reverse order, I went to uh, Lompoc Federal Prison Camp. And one of the misconceptions that I had about going to a federal prison camp was that it would be um, populated by white collar uh, mm -hmm. offenders. And although there were some there, uh, they made up uh, at most 10% of the population. And that was about the same thing for me. I was at Taft Federal Prison Camp, the other camp on the West Coast. About 500 prisoners there, maybe 10 to 12 percent or so, roughly white collar offenders. So who's the balance? So we've already identified one segment of, of people in prison, a white collar offender, of course. What made up the balance from your experience? Well, there were uh, two groups. There were uh, nonviolent uh, drug offenders with uh, 10 years or less on their sentence. And then there were uh, another group who had qualified by their behavior yep. uh, and by having 10 years or less on their sentence. Uh, to be placed at a federal prison camp. So that's interesting because when I surrendered, I, I did very little preparations. It's part of the reason we do these videos. I prepared yes. terribly. And I remember walking the track, and I write about this in le my book, Lessons from Prison, that I'll send to anybody who wants a copy. I was walking the track, and I said to a friend that I had made, wow, at least uh, there are no nonviolent guys here, and you know, um, everyone has 10 years or less. And he corrected me, and he was like, dude, one, don't think because you're in a camp there are hasn't been some violence taking place by someone who's been here. Maybe they didn't get caught for it. I'm like, well, that kind of freaked me out. And two, he pointed out some guys that had been in prison 20, 30, 40 years. Right. And I said, well, I thought you have to have 10 years or less to go to a camp. What does that mean? And he touched on what you just said, that you might go to a higher security prison and then work work your way down. Did you, ex did you know that when you surrendered to Lompoc, that there were going to be guys who'd been in penitentiaries, highs, medium, and lows? Did you know that? No, I did not. I really did not. And the one of the differences between people like that and the rest of the population is the level uh, to which they're institutionalized. Mm -hmm. um, by that, I mean uh, the, the extent to which they have been um, used to being in uh, confinement. Sure. And uh, it's they're very different uh, in terms of personality and the way they interact with everyone else. That's interesting, the term institutionalization. That's a big word. I still, to this day, struggle to define it. I think it's one that people, I, I think people have their own definitions of it. For me, yeah. I would define institutionalization as your happiness is contingent on what's happening around you. So, for example, in prison, you know, if you don't get your, if mail doesn't come at three o'clock or they skip a day, it can really freak you out. If you call home right. and someone doesn't pick up his plan, uh, you can really freak out. If the TV yep. is down when you're expecting to watch a show, you freak out. If you're, they're out of bananas in the, the commissary, you freak out. So a lot of that happiness comes from the institution and it can really derail your day and obsessing over things that you cannot control. And I'll admit during my brief stay in federal prison, I felt that way at times when I was expecting something and it didn't happen. You can feel that pain of um, the pain of confinement. For those of you watching, That's right. yeah, for those of you watching, I want you to, there are low levels of violence in a camp, even if someone, it's, and I'm not saying anyone I served time with, you know, was there for a violent crime or did something didn't get caught. Part of the reason there's lower levels of uh, violence in a camp, because you have people that have a clearly defined release date, right? So when yes. you're in a low, it could be 20 years, a medium, much higher. Uh, when you're in a camp, uh, you know when you're coming home and that can make it easier on those who might have a tendency to get angry or upset if you respond in an appropriate way. Also too, Justin, the risk uh, to anybody there of engaging in violent behavior is substantial because you're immediately removed from the sure. camp. Uh, you go the whole, the whole yep, thing. You're placed in solitary and then rather than being released back to the camp, you're moved up 
in the uh, you know in the security level. You're moved to a uh, low. Mm -hmm. uh, at least uh, you might be moved to a different state. You may be moved to a place where your loved ones are unable to sure. visit, um, and it can be very, very uh, troubling. So, as a result, and everyone knows this, uh, the consequences, the violence um, is minimal. So we talk a little bit. We have drug offenders in federal prison camp. We have white collar offenders now. As we get a little more involved in um, those two groups, I'll admit when I s surrendered. I formed some friendships too quickly. I, I was yeah. uh, didn't fully understand yeah. living in confinement. I was uh, a little too talkative at first, and I noticed upon my you know surrender that I had formed a friendship with someone who I later learned was talking to the guards. And again, there are white collar offenders who lay low and prepare those who are angry and complain and everything in between. So let's transition to the guards. That's another type of person we're going to meet right. in prison. Right. The staff. Uh, right your relationship with the guards and how you viewed other white collar offenders or drug offenders who conversed with with staff and recommend, recommendations you might have for someone going in. Um, well, first of all, there's a, a general rule. Um, don't ask. Mm -hmm. Don't ask for help. Don't ask for um, anything from the guards generally. Um, that's the general rule. And the, rule uh, the reason for that is they're going to turn you down if they can. Um, and you risk disappointment, which is a very frustrating uh, thing in, in that environment. Um, the other reason for not talking with guards is that you raise suspicion among the other uh, inmates. Um, if you're uh, seen uh, engaging in friendly conversation with guards, the suspicion is what are you talking about? Sure. And are you revealing any uh, secrets or information about things that are going on uh, among the inmates? And that is, that's very bad and very risky. Yeah, um, I, I, I totally agree. In Lessons from Prison, I was, you were at Lompoc, I wrote about a gentleman in Chapter 21 where he was talking to the guards at Lompoc or he complained, talked about a fellow prisoner. And within a day or so, fellow inmates were pouring feces into his sheets. It was awful. He went to cust protective custody. He transferred to, to Taft. But if it were prison camps on the West Coast, uh, word spreads. Everyone learned. And he served his time very alone, without friends, isolated, right. forever being looked at as someone that you know speaks with with staff. I wasn't disrespectful to staff. If they opened the door for me, I'd say I'd say thank you. Uh, but there was very little upside for me in communicating with them. And at times both drug offender and white collar will speak with staff and that's fine that's their journey i just see very little i just see very little upside in it and if right. you're going to uh, surrender to prison and live there i think it's better to, to to lay low be careful about the friendships that you make and understand um all of the personalities around you because as i said earlier if you run into someone you don't like at starbucks you're not going to eat with them every day or shower next to them or sleep next to them and it could be much harder to unwind some friendships that have gotten off to the wrong start. Let's transition to another type of person you meet in prison, which is a federal prison hustler. They can be white collar okay. offender and drug offender alike. Yep. In my book, Lessons from Prison, I engaged in the hustle too quickly. I was a little naive and too eager to live a very privileged life in prison. I got lucky I could have gotten into some trouble. What was your experience with the federal prison hustler and what advice would you give to someone uh, who too wants to live that privileged life on the inside about hustling? Well, first of all, there are varying degrees of what would be considered a hustle. For example, yeah. um, there are people who you can pay to do your laundry sure. or you can pay them to make your bed or something like that. Um, you know, and those types of things are very innocuous. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, they can help you within uh, the environment. If you're sure. a white collar offender, you're perceived of have, as having a higher economic level and to the extent that you can share um, something with uh, people who are uh, struggling financially within the system, um, you know, that, that's a good way to, uh, to be seen, for sure. example. Um, on the other hand, um, there are people who you know, they may open their, their locker and you'll see hundreds of dollars of stamps or you'll sure. see actual money. Um, those are things that you really need to watch out for and be careful of. Uh, and people that are engaged in that are people that, that generally you need to, to stay away from. Um, you can rest assured that um, within any amount of time, anyone engaged in a financial hustle 
uh, is going to be known by the guards. The guards will inspect lockers. They, uh, you know, they will take note if you have sure. too many stamps or something like that. So the people who are engaged in that are people who uh, are being watched closely by the staff. Sure, and, and you'll learn there are some things staff accepts on the hustle side, and yes. there are some things where you've clearly crossed the line. So again, right. before anyone seeks to manipulate the systems of corrections in the hustle, understand that environment as I didn't do. Understand that environment before you seek to exploit it uh, to your advantage. Quick quick takeaway, when I was on the inside on a slightly different matter, some people in prison will not do their job. And that's just the way that it goes. And yeah. you cannot complain about it. When I was working in the kitchen, we were, some of the, the guys with whom I worked, some guys on the staff uh, uh, never showed up to work. I'm telling you, never showed up. I remember <laughs> one white collar friend who would get so angry that he was doing somebody else's job. And one day just venting, he's like, where are these people? Why aren't they showing up for work? And it was white collar guys and some drug offenders. They just never showed up. And the staff, the guard said, who isn't here? And, you know, in prison, oh. sometimes they'll do a call in or check in to make sure that someone's there for work. It didn't happen a whole lot at Taft. Right. And then suddenly, like, over the loud system, look who isn't there, show up for work. The inmates walk in and they say, okay, you know, so who's the snitch? He wasn't yeah. looking to complain about anybody. He wasn't looking to turn them in. He just vented loudly. A staff member heard him. And his this guy's experience was dramatically worse as he just got there to serve three years for Medicare fraud from San Diego. And I remember thinking, I'm glad I kept my, my mouth shut. If I have to do yes. somebody else's job, so be it. I just want to work hard, stay quiet, and get home to my family. Let's transition as we wrap up this video, mental health issues. Uh, there's a large segment of people in prison who shouldn't be there, as we know, but also some mental health issues. And part of the reason I think we should be cognizant of the people with whom we associate is because there are people on, on medications and who have some mental health issues. Did you experience that at Lompoc? And uh, what advice would you have for those who are surrendering and might come across people who might be a little bit unstable? Well, um, to start with, uh, one of the reasons some of the people are there is because of that issue. Yep. Uh, whether they're um, you know leveled out by medication or not, um, you know, it's, it's fairly obvious, it's pretty apparent. Mm -hmm. um, there was one fellow who, uh, on the other extreme, he um, had been there for uh, a long time, and he was uh, elderly and had Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. um, and very, very sad to see someone like that in that environment. Mm -hmm. um, the staff was so callous toward this person. Mm -hmm. um, and it became very, very clear as he was descending uh, through his disease that the only way he was going to be able to uh, survive in the environment until he was released was with the help of uh, the other inmates. And people chipped in. They made sure that he was fed, dressed, uh, that he was where he was supposed to be. People walked him around. And, and, and you know, it was really um, remarkable uh, to watch. There, um, there, there and, is a closeness that comes, a sort of a looking out for one another, a brotherhood that I yes. didn't expect when I surrendered. Uh, and I was naive, and I'll admit, I presume that many of my friends on the inside would be white collar offenders, and this will be my final takeaway. I'd love to turn it over to you once I'm done. I presumed all of my friends would be white collar offenders because, I don't know, I said I went to USC, I was a stockbroker, that's with whom I'll associate. And of course I did have some white collar offender friends, but I also formed friends and learned so much from long-term prisoners who were there for, for drug crimes. They inspired me, they had a different sense of perspective. Right. Uh, I had opportunities in life that they might not have had, and uh, they didn't complain. They served their time with a great deal of, of dignity. And I never expected that when I surrendered to prison, that some of my closest friends or my bunkie, who I'd cook dinner with four nights a week, would be serving 20 years for, for a drug crime. Uh, and he's someone that I think about as much as anyone else upon my release from prison. So go in with open eye. You know, be yes. so, you, you'll be pleasantly surprised. There are great people that you can learn from, perspectives that you can gain. It was so, I developed a sense of tolerance. Um, I don't know, I didn't expect that when I surrendered to, to prison. Did you uh, give me your final takeaway on some of the people you meet in prison? Well, I, I think what you're saying is um, use it as much uh, to your advantage or to, to, you know, use it as an opportunity mm -hmm. to the extent that you can. And uh, to the extent that you can learn about people who you would never have uh, learned about, it is an opportunity to broaden your horizons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, take it, take advantage of, of the 
you know, the opportunities that are, that exist there. There aren't many. Um, you know, I think primarily you need to use the time uh, to reflect on yourself, to figure out how and why you got there, uh, to make sure that you're going to be in a position to thrive when you leave, and also uh, to be in a position where you're not going to be inclined to return. Uh, that's terrific advice. I thank you for sharing it. If anyone has questions, feel free to reach out uh, to Jeff or me, and we hope you found value in this White Collar 101 video, the people that you meet in prison. Jeff, thank you so much, bud. Thank you, too. Okay.